uh, what we have here at AB10 is special, and we need to protect it and nurture it, because uh, I wish we were doing this in other regions of the world, this sort of cooperative effort. So I thank God for it. Uh, my subject I'm speaking on today is thinking missionally in context about theological education, uh, a case for diversified and integrated approach. In 2 Kings chapter 3, the kings of Judah and Israel and Edom were headed out to go against Moab. And they go toward Moab and they find themselves in a desert. And seven days they are wandering without water. They are in danger of dying. And they say, let's go inquire of Elisha and see what we ought to do. And the word they get from Elisha is a very interesting word. He tells them, start digging ditches in the desert. Just start digging ditches. To us, it is a very unusual idea to think about digging ditches in the desert. But God sent rain. And as those rains came, those ditches filled with water. And it watered the men in the armies. They went on to defeat Moab. Today I want us to consider ditches that we need to dig as theological educators that must be dug for us to be ready for the blessing of rain that God is sending on Africa. In 2015, the growth projections for Christianity in Africa were compelling. According to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, by 2025, the majority of the world's Christians would live in Africa, over 700 million. In 2022, the report estimated the number of Christians in Africa already at 692 million and projected it would exceed 1.2 billion by 2050. It has indeed rained in Africa, but more rain is coming. There's little doubt that Africa is now the center of global Christianity, and it is growing more rapidly than anticipated. But we have not dug enough ditches. The current levels of theological education in Africa are already at a crisis point. According to Conrad Mbewe, 90% of the people who are currently functioning as pastors are untrained. Most of the 700 million Christians in today's Africa do not have an adequately equipped shepherd. Without a course correction, imagine the impact of this when it is amplified to 1.2 billion. So the question is, will the African church be a missional enterprise that exports the hope of the true gospel? Or will it be spiritually unhealthy and export a marred version of the gospel? The answer to that question depends on the theology of Africa's pastors and ministry leaders. Tackling the problem of training hundreds of thousands of pastors is not simple. A decade ago, the Global Survey on Theological Education found widespread agreement among theological educators that we have to have theological education. It's essential for the future of world Christianity. Yet where the gospel is expanding quickly, there are not enough theological schools. For our current institutions, those represented in this room and those outside of this room, to educate enough pastors for 1.2 billion Christians by 2050 and launch a mission-sending venture is not possible currently. The same survey revealed that most theological educators say that African theological institutions are at a financial risk point. But theological education is not ancillary to the Great Commission. Theological education is integral to the Great Commission. Africa's obedience to all the Great Commissions, specifically the task of teaching them to obey all things, is currently not possible as long as the majority of our leaders have not been taught. Success cannot be 
measured by whether we succeed in our own enterprise. Our goal must be an Africa trained and ready to reach the nations. So to begin this discussion, I want to explore three things. First of all, I want us to look at the developing story of theological education, some of the systemic challenges we are facing, and how we might consider adapting to be mission ready. And thereafter, we'll have some time to discuss some possible next steps. I want to begin by looking at the way theological education developed as the gospel took root and began to spread. What is that developing story of theological education? I'm indebted to Justo Gonzalez, his excellent work. If you've not read it, The History of Theological Education, I commend it to you. To fulfill Jesus' mandate to make disciples of all nations, the early church had the task of planting local churches wherever the gospel spread. To ensure that new disciples were taught to obey all things, churches needed leaders that were able and qualified to teach. Now, Paul gives us an indication of how the early church navigated this in 2 Timothy 2.2. The things which you have seen and heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful people who will also be able to teach others. In God's providence, this approach had an intrinsic ability to create enormous capacity. We need to remember that word. And it could keep pace with the rapidly expanding gospel. By the second century, the expansion of the gospel brought the gospel into communities that were far from the monotheism of the early Christians. And for this reason, attention was given to training all church members. Prior to baptism, candidates for inclusion in the assembly of the, of the redeemed, the local church, were discipled for up to two years, the catechumenates. This provided a base level of theological training to all baptized believers and made it possible to disciple and develop pastors and church leaders from within the church. More complex issues were handled at larger cities. This created a two-level effect where you had local training in the church and you had outside the church those who could deal with deeper theological issues to keep the movement going forward. After the fourth century, theological thinking and education moved more towards centralized authority. Meanwhile, the rapid spread of Christianity made the practice of this long discipleship unworkable. In time, the church no longer took responsibility for theological competency. And theological education moved further from the people. As bishops solidified their authority over doctrine, various monastic orders developed in which some withdrew to give themselves to studying theology and experiencing the things of God. By the Middle Ages, theological training had passed from the Pauline model to the catechumenate model, and then on to a sort of sacerdotal model where a few highly educated thought about theology separated from the church. We know that in the 11th century, thereabouts, a university system began to develop to train pastors. This led, of course, in time to the Reformation. And after the Reformation, this university system became the root of both American and European systems. Through the 19th century, theological education became increasingly scholastic. And this is significant for us today because the, the intersection between missions and theology, much of the modern mission movement, which began in the late 18th century, used the scholastic model as the primary means for theological education in areas where mission endeavors took root. Today, we're moving more toward a formational approach. Now, it's a very broad summary, but why does it matter? This helps us hold our own methods with a looser grip. Because we understand that finding appropriate models and concepts to teach theology has been normal practice for Christian theologians for over 2,000 years. Whatever our approach is today, brothers and sisters, it will not remain the same. So what are the challenges we are facing that are keeping this a persistent problem? Just as missionaries 
study the unique context and culture of a people to whom they are sent, so we as theological educators must understand the context in which we live. So let's look at some of these challenges, break them down. First of all, there are challenges faced by potential students, and we need to hear these. Many students cannot access, access institutional theological education because of four common barriers. They are proximity, time, finances, and academic qualification. In 2020, 58% of the population of Africa was still rural. For most who need training, there is no Bible college or seminary nearby. These potential students are not hoping to be in ministry. They are, most of them, already serving in ministry. And they cannot leave their families, their ministries, to go off to school. And even if they could, many lack the academic qualifications to enter our institutions. And beyond that, the lack of financial resources remains a significant barrier. And any one of these four barriers, just any one, will keep a student from accessing theological education. There are also challenges of literacy and structure. All types of theological education, formal, institutional, storying, online, decentralized, you name it, can be described in terms of how much literacy they require and how much structure they employ. Look at this simple graph on the screen. All approaches to theological education can be located somewhere sort of along this diagonal line, moving from the lower left quadrant to the upper right quadrant. A person-to-person -person storying approach would be in the lower left quadrant. Institutional education would exist in the upper right quadrant and higher degrees all the way up into the far right corner. But as the locus moves from the lower left to the upper right, increasing levels of structure and literacy create more formidable barriers. This explains why institutions at their best can only serve a limited number of students. No matter how hard we try, the institution itself cannot extend training to all the 90% who lack training. Currently, about one-third of all Christians in Africa cannot be taught using a model that is literacy dependent. That's about 233 million people. Whether the same percentage of pastors are literate or not, it is likely that significantly more than a third of Africa's Christians retain orality as their primary means of communicating and understanding the world in which they live. While building more and lasting institutions is important, we must not invest solely in the upper right quadrant. But there's also the challenge of capacity and depth. One of the greatest barriers that perhaps may be unrecognized comes from the relationship that exists between depth and capacity. What we teach, how much we teach, and how deeply we teach affects how many we can teach. There is an inverse proportional relationship between depth and capacity. The capacity of training, its capacity, is dependent on its depth. Let's look at this, how this affects our ability to meet this current massive need. On the screen, notice that as the level of training deepens, capacity is becoming smaller and smaller. Degree training is shown in darker green. In an academic setting, students can study subjects beyond essential theology, including church history, biblical languages, intercultural studies, comparative religion. This produces graduates who can work within their context to strategize, problem solve, and help lead the broader movement of the gospel. That's why we keep doing it, because it matters. The depth, however, does limit its capacity making it incapable of addressing the massive need we are facing. The top of the triangle could represent conferences. Wide capacity, but not very deep. A conference can train hundreds or even thousands in a few hours or a few days. But it cannot deliver depth that is needed. Replicating training in the middle, like the early church used, exists in the gap between the two. It can remove some of the barriers we've discussed, 
It can be orality based or it can be literacy based. And while it's not designed to deliver the depth of an academic degree, replication, and we know it from church history, is a possible way to address our capacity problem. So how can we adapt to increase access and capacity? Each type of theological education is useful and must be maximized to do what it does best. Rather than look at these types of theological education as separate things, we must begin to see them as integrated into one strategy, one strategy that comprises lots of parts. We need to draw from our history of theological training and employ multiple approaches to do the job. Let me describe what I mean. All stakeholders, for instance, should affirm the need for academic training. Outside of this meeting, someone might say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't the presence of hundreds of thousands of pastors without training mean, hey, let's pull out of institutional training and let's do the other? Should we do that? The resounding answer is no. As Will Brooks recently stated in his book, while more believers exist today in the global south, the majority of theological resources are still produced by theologians in the West. This must change. Christianity is not an American or European religion. Highly skilled African theologians training African theologians is essential. The question we must ask, and this is the hard one, brothers and sisters, is how many pastors and leaders need advanced degrees? What percentage of pastors and leaders must have a BD, an MA, an MDiv, or a PhD? Reality calls us to acknowledge the obvious. If we require all pastors and missionaries to have academic degrees, the number who meet that standard will only be a fraction of what we need. An integrated strategic approach can affirm the necessity of academic degrees for some and also embrace alternate forms of qualification. The need for essential theological education far outpaces the capacity of the academy. We know that. So what is essential? What is a reasonable baseline of theological education that should be required? Remember that inverted triangle. Requiring too much depth will deny training to the hundreds of thousands who currently lack it. If the training is too shallow, it will not provide enough essential theology for future needs. One possibility is to prioritize theology. What theology must be taught first? This type of prioritization is what Albert Moeller called theological triage. He wrote that first order doctrines represent the most fundamental truths of the Christian faith. And a denial of these doctrines represents nothing less than an eventual denial of Christianity itself. We know there are subjects that would help a pastor be better at his job, but we also recognize that there are subjects without which a pastor will likely move into heterodoxy. Theological triage can help determine what content is needed by all pastors and leaders including those beyond the reach of the academy. The model used by the early church provides a template for delivering essential theological content at high capacity. Their replicating model was built like a link and chain. Now this differs from an institutional model which functions more like a hub with spokes. Capacity in a hub and spoke model is determined by the size of the hub, that's the sum of its resources, its facilities, faculty, curriculum, etc. And the capacity can be increased by enlarging the size of the hub or lengthening its spokes. Innovations like distance and online learning, hybrid on-campus models, satellite campus, etc. can increase the capacity of the institution and all those should be in front of us for consideration. But a link and chain model is built for capacity. The chain can continue to grow infinitely so long as new links are added. It provides the kind of capacity needed to scale delivery of essential doctrines required by theological triage. Using both a hub and spoke 
and a Lincoln chain model is similar to the two-level approach used in the early church, localized theological training and more complex issues being relegated to those who are thinking about deeper things. To give you an idea of how this Lincoln chain approach can provide enormous capacity and deliver essential theological education, I want you to hear from two of my friends. So David and Ellie, would you guys come and join us on the stage? And Craig Kendrick is going to come and help me as well. For the last 12 years, World Hope Ministries International's Bible Institute has been using a link and chain model. Listen to this, exploring how much theological education can be replicated. World Hope is currently using this model to catalyze theological education across 50 nations in more than 180 locations. In 2014, we opened a new location of World Hope's Bible Institute in Yamasukro. Hundreds of eager, eager students, most already serving in ministry, attended the first courses. For the next four years, students received 16 courses of theology in a multi-day intensive format. Lectures were taught from the course notes and included lots, lots of small group discussion. In 2017, over 300 students graduated. Contin Cambire David was one of those who became an instructor after he graduated. He now serves as a regional coordinator there. David leads a network that has since opened 15 locations in Ivory Coast and has graduated over 900 students. They are also going to the nations. They've opened new locations in Burkina Faso, in Guinea, in Niger, Benin, and Senegal. And they're planning now for Mali and the Gambia. Elkana Eli Swaro is from South Sudan. Eli has a deep burden to provide theological education to the many pastors in South Sudan who have very few options. We've worked with Eli to open a location in South Sudan. He's already expanding the work even as we've begun. And I just want to ask these brothers some questions. And so, Craig, if you'll help out, because we won't be able to see what he's saying on the screen here. We'll do this part of the translation live. Uh, David, tell us what changes you have seen in those leaders who have finally gotten theological education. So, I bless the Lord for the ministry of World Hope in the Ivory Coast. Cette formation a permis de voir beaucoup de changements dans la vie de certains serviteurs qui n'avaient pas de formation. This teaching, I, I've observed many changes that have happened in the students who have come to, to, to have the teaching of World Hope Bible Institute. Et je partage comme ça les témoignages d'un étudiant. So I'm going to share a testimony of one of our students. Tout à l'heure dans la présentation de Dr. Epeli, il a parlé de certaines personnes qui dirigent des centres de prière. Uh, Earlier, Dr. Sheehan shared a, a, a story of, of those pastors who, or maybe it was someone else, shared the story of, of those pastors who, they start prayer camps, but they kind of do it on their own, without any theological formation. So... There was, a, there was a, one of our students who was going to start a church, and his leader said, well, you need to get some money, you need to buy a chicken, and you need to do a sacrifice for the land that you're going to put that church on. It was by the teaching of World Hope that he understood that his leader was in a false teaching and that he did not need to do those kind of things. L'enseignement des actions prophétiques de, de, de l'évangile de prospérité qui ont eu beaucoup de changements par les cours de World Hope. He said there's many students in, in Yamasukro that came that were under the influence of many false prophets and those under the influence of many prosperity gospel teachers who when they came in and, and had the teaching of World Hope, they understood that they were under false teaching. Il y a tant de témoignages actuellement Parmi les jeunes serviteurs qui n'avaient aucune formation théologique. Merci. Hey, and we have dozens of, uh, of testimonies of, of young men who wanted teaching but couldn't have it. But when World Hope came in offering free theological education, 
they were so happy to be able to receive it so that they could better lead their churches. Mm, praise the Lord. David, let me ask you another question. Uh, how have the graduates gotten a burden for others to get the training? Donc, David, comment les diplômés, ceux qui ont, qui ont, qui ont reçu la formation, comment eux, ils ont un cœur pour les autres maintenant? Les diplômés actuellement de Wall Open Côte d'Ivoire qui, qui sont plus que déterminés dans cet appel. So he says the graduates are more than motivated to help others like they've been helped. Et aujourd'hui, si nous avons pu ouvrir plusieurs centres, ça grâce à ces diplômés qui ont reçu et qui sont allés eh, mobiliser dans les régions pour que nous ouvrons ces centres. He says we graduated 300 in 2017. There, there, there are dozens of the, the very motivated graduates who have, who have gone and helped start the other locations in their cities where they came from to have the teaching in Yamasukro. Et aujourd'hui, nous sommes encore plus mobilisés pour aider le Niger. So he said, today we're, we're even more motivated each time we have a graduation to help the countries next to us, as, as you can see. And one of those countries that we're really motivated to help right now is Niger, Niger. On a déjà fait l'ouverture là-bas avec plus de 100 étudiants. We started in January with some of our graduates with more than 100 students in Niamey. Donc tous les étudiants formés de Côte d'Ivoire sont plus mobilisés à pouvoir apporter leur assistance à ce peuple euh, un peu pauvre. When the hundreds of graduates of the World Hope Bible Institute heard that we were going to start in Niamey, Niger, they knew that there was great need for the pastors there. They, with, with da David's leadership, they all together mobilized to get money and other resources so that they could have their notebooks and the food during the teaching already re ready from the Ivoirian pastors. Sans hmm. compter notre rassemblement annuel de tous les étudiants qui nous nous tenons une fois par an pour étudier et parler de la mission. And he said, lastly, hundreds of the graduates we meet yearly to just discuss theology, to discuss problems we're having, and to discuss how we can help each other mobilize to train other pastors in our country and in the countries around us. Merci. Amen. Amen. Uh, Ellie, stand up there with, uh, with, with David. Ellie, in your context, why is the possibility of replicating this link and chain, why is that important in South Sudan? Well, uh, replication is very important because uh, the next generation of leaders need to be raised now. And uh, looking at the context of South Sudan uh, and looking at some of the challenges that are, has been discussed here, proximity, finances, and all those kind of things. Yes, we have majority of pastors also not trained in South Sudan. And also with the wave of pros, uh, prosperity gospel coming up, if we don't replicate, if we don't use the repl replication uh, method to train these, these leaders, then pros uh, prosperity gospel is going to take them up. Mm -hmm. And then we will not be able to get leaders in the next generation who can preach biblical doctrine. So replication is necessary so that we can be able to bring theological education even to the hard to reach places to those areas, to those remote areas where people are not able to get a theological education so that they can be able to train and have and teach sound biblical doctrine. So Ellie, when we open a new location, uh, the first course we always teach is the doctrine of salvation. You recently had uh, a really interesting experience teaching pastors. Tell us about that in that first course in one of your new locations. Yeah, well, in uh, one of our locations, uh, far from the city, uh, when we were teaching soteriology, that is doctrine of salvation, uh, the class of more than 100 students, uh, on the first day of teaching the course, more than 30 of the students gave their life to Christ. And one of the reasons they gave was that they have never understood the doctrine of salvation. And these people, these are leaders who have been preaching. These are leaders who have been pastoring churches. But of course, because they were not exposed to any theological training. So, having that opportunity to learn and learning about doctrine of salvation and other, and, and, and other uh, theological training or theological courses exposes them to the truth. Amen. Thank you, Ellie. David, let me ask you one more question. 
you recently had a, started a partnership with Burkina Faso. Donc il a dit récemment tu as fait un partenariat avec le Burkina why are, Faso. Why are you excited about that partnership in particular? Pourquoi tu es enthousiasmé avec, avec ce partenariat au Burkina Faso? Ce partenariat au Burkina Faso grâce à un de nos diplômés, le pasteur Douli. So he says this partnership in Burkina Faso was because of one of our graduates who lived in the northern border of Ivory Coast who knew pastors in the southern part of Burkina Faso. He opened that partnership. Une grande bénédiction. It's been a huge blessing for us. Par ce partenariat aujourd'hui, by that partnership today, nous avons pu atteindre le Sénégal. We We've also developed partnerships with those pastors in Burkina Faso who knew pastors in Senegal, which allowed us to present the World Hope Bible Institute to, to a new location in Senegal. And by this partnership also, not only are we teaching 200 pastors in Burkina Faso, but we, we've also been able to start the translation of their local language Lobiri, which is an unreached people group, and translate the courses into their, their local language. Sans compter plus de 200 anciens et diacres de l'église EP que nous rassemblons deux fois dans l'année pour l'enseignement. Et, et, as I said earlier, the, the, we have 200 elders and, and deacons that are being trained in southern Burkina Faso. Two, two times a year, I think we've gotten through 10 courses of the 16 already. And, and again, that, that it has also permitted them to meet that translation team to help them translate. Donc ce partenariat est une grande bénédiction et qui va avoir un impact glorieux dans les jours à venir. So that partnership is a huge blessing for us and it will bring a lot of glory to God in the church in Burkina Faso and Northern Ivory Coast. Amen. Join me in thanking these brothers if you would. The capacity provided by this model is encouraging. In West Africa alone, regional coordinators like David anticipate around 3,000 active students and 1,500 graduates by 2024. And they expect that to double again by 2026. This is an indigenously led movement. We coach, we encourage, we help. We help them measure and evaluate for quality. Providing first tier theological education and beyond at scale is possible. So what steps now we, do we need to think about taking toward a more diversified or integrated approach to theological education? Folks, we have some ditches to dig. But we will dig more and better ditches if we dig them together. All types of theological education and all denominations and associations and mission organizations need to cultivate together a unified strategy for theological education. And so here are some thoughts on next steps to move in that direction. First of all, steps for providers. That's everybody from morality networks to replication training like World Hope is doing to our largest and oldest seminaries. Institutions are vital. They must, however, work to increase their capacity, embracing a broad openness to innovation. As they embrace their mandate to provide academic degrees, they must realize that they can only meet a small portion of the need. Consequently, they must view those working outside of the academy as partners, not competitors. Just as leaders in larger cities supported localized training in the second and third centuries, institutions can embrace non-institutional approaches, seeing them as possible on-ramps for students who take those non-traditional approaches to one day make it to the academy. Those working in less formal and non-traditional approaches must support the institutions. They serve to extend training to those who cannot access the institution. They can function as the Pauline model did, providing operational theology for the local church. And when appropriate, those students that they train 
should be encouraged to continue formal training. Secondly, there are steps for denominations and associations. Denominations and associations should invest in their institutions, in their Bible colleges, in their seminaries. They provide the deep thinkers and the strategists who are essential for the future of the gospel. Institutions require funding, and denominations and associations should help them with that financial support. But denominations need to face a reality. If they require all pastors and missionaries to receive academic degrees, they will perpetuate the current situation. Theological triage is another way to qualify leaders. If denominations choose an academic degree only approach to qualification, as many as one million pastors in the future will be serving in Africa without any denominational affiliation over, or oversight. And by 2050, these untrained and unaffiliated pastors will be shepherding most of the 1.2 billion Christians in Africa. There are also steps for churches. Churches are the chosen centerpiece of God's missional engagement. Everything we do, if it's not supporting the local church, we might as well stop doing it because the church is God's choice through which to change the world. Churches need to support their academic institutions. It's a long-term investment in the future spiritual health of Africa. And direct relationships with Bible colleges and seminaries between the local churches are essential. They help those institutions remain theologically tethered to the people they serve. Churches also have an important task closer to home. Just as churches took responsibility for theological training during the early centuries of Christianity, churches today must lead the effort to train their church members. Our churches should be highly productive incubators of future missionaries and future church leaders rather than a welcoming place for false teaching like the prosperity gospel. There are also steps for mission senders. As Africa becomes a sender to the nations, leaders will decide what constitutes adequate theological preparation for a missionary. Similarly, missionaries will need to determine the type of theological training they will use where the gospel takes root. Whereas 19th and 20th century mission movements preferred a scholastic approach, future mission senders should explore other options in addition to the institution. The Pauline model used by the early church can provide sufficient depth and capacity to supply mission centers and church planting movements. Those with advanced theological education can shepherd these mission endeavors as they develop, just as leaders did in the third and fourth century. In time, more formal training can be developed. The scope of the mission requires building theological education from the ground up instead of from the top down. Evangelistic growth does not have to outpace teaching them to obey all things. Here's some final thoughts. This is not only for Africa's sake. The shepherding of 1.2 billion Christians ought to be enough to call us to immediate action. There is, however, a higher reason to engage in this work it is the spread of the gospel beyond Africa's coast. Africa could be mobilizing tens of thousands of missionaries by 2050. Whether this will be a healthy missional engagement may depend on our choices today. Africa's denominations, institutions, churches, and missionary mobilizers must realize that without fundamental change, the great move of Christianity in Africa will not have the kind of positive impact it could and should. At this point, we've simply not dug enough ditches to capture the rain. If all stakeholders, all of us, 
work together to build a healthy theological foundation, Africa's mission engagement could be unparalleled. Daniel Ellishire served as the executive director of the Association of Theological Schools from 1977 to 2017. In calling for ongoing adaptation and change within theological education, he wrote, does the next theological education need to be different from the last one? I have contended that historically, theological education has been influenced by culture, by the church and religious practice, and by higher education. If these influential variables did not change, then theological education would not need to change. Maybe if one or two remained the same, theological education would not need to change. As best I can tell, however, all three are changing. Alishar's reflections were based on decades of working within the American theological landscape. The current context and the projected spiritual futures of America and Africa are vastly different. His words, nonetheless, I believe are prophetic for us. To think missionally, we must change, embracing a diversified and integrated approach to theological education. As theological educators, our role is to embrace a comprehensive strategy. We must work together to create enough capacity to make appropriate levels of theological education accessible. That will require a variety of approaches. This is essential for Africa's full engagement in the Great Commission. I've tried to give us a place to start a conversation, but there are some questions I have raised that are much better answered by you. So let's dig some ditches. For the next few minutes, I've given you some questions to discuss around your tables. And there are three. We're going to put them on the screen here. How can you work to create capacity in your sector? In other words, if you're an institution, what are next steps you can take as an institution to widen your front door, to see more students come? That's essential. If you're doing non-traditional approaches or orality approaches, how can you expand your capacity? Secondly, and this perhaps is where I would really like us to spend the most time discussing, how can you partner with those outside your sector to create a more integrated strategy? I believe that's very important. And then finally, and to our point, how should or could a theologically equipped Africa foster a missionary sending Africa. Let's take the next few minutes and discuss that around our tables. How can you work to increase capacity in your sector? Did anybody get a good answer to that? Yes. At the very back, the farthest corner for you to run. With what uh, Dr. Spart has taught us now, it is easy for us to see that there may be need for our institutions to embrace new methods and approaches that will enhance and strengthen theological sound theological education and sound mm -hmm. doctrine in our mm -hmm. institutions. How would they do that? In one way, we have become so afraid and we are trying to guide our denominational values, thinking that in doing that, uh, we will be able to sustain certain things. However, it is good when we are doing that. At the same time, we are blocking others who will have benefited from us. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two thing there is that the people we are training are limited. And now we must think beyond our denomination. If we are going to be missionary, we must try to be ecumenical. Now we're thinking, embracing other people, especially those who are uh, planting churches outside us, and they are unable to have the privilege of theology education. Maybe by family challenge, 
maybe by qualification challenge, because you know in our schools we have qualifications that we have said prerequisite. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Before you can do this, you must embrace this, you must have this. this those things, we must create another platform that we embrace such. I cannot blame the president. I'm talking of college educators. In some cases, they have been affected by the regulators of the schools, stakeholders of the schools, like governing council, like the ministerial training board, like the theological, uh, theological training uh, team. They have told them, we have trained a lot of people, like in Nigeria now, we have trained a lot of people who have become unemployed. Hmm. How do we check that? Governing council has to say, please, please, stop training people. Because those we train that are yet to get places of service are becoming threats to the pastors who are serving. They are creating crisis in the churches. Instead of them to go and plant church, they don't do that. So, in, not, in a nutshell, curriculum we are writing now must encourage more church planting activities as we are training people. Hmm. Number two, our governing council as well must see beyond denominationalism. Must try to work on our conservative lifestyle. We must embrace opportunities that will accommodate non-Baptists. I'm only talking about Baptists now. That is non-denominational uh, church uh, leaders or founders who are indigenous among us, who have founded churches, but they are not trained because they are more than us now. That is all I can say. Can, can you hand the microphone to, to Stuart for just a moment? I want to ask him a question. How do we, and, and excuse me for using the word, if it's offensive, I don't mean to be, I'm just trying to use the, the, the particular thing. How do we indigenize a diversified model? Because there are many organizations like I'm not saying better than, but like World Hope, there's TLI, there's yep. Advance International. There are lots of people around the world who have seen the need to try to address this kind of a level. Where So we have African institutions, then we have church-based theological education, and then there's that excluded middle. I'm using it in a different way than Hebert, but that excluded middle. And so there are a lot, I mean, I could name more just that, that I know of. And most of those are still Western-driven. How do we Africanize those or indigenize those? Yeah, I think one of the things we have to do is we, we who operate those kinds of ministries have got to be able to give the teaching away. It is so important. I will just tell you, I, I haven't gotten our second quarter report, but as of the first quarter of this year, globally, 78% of all courses have been taught by nationals we have trained around the world. And it's not that uh, nationals do not want to become instructors, but oftentimes we who have the education, we're holding the power cards. And it becomes exploitative when we who have the power, that is the education, the PhDs, refuse to give away the teaching to those who don't have the same degrees that we have. We've got to be able to let that go and empower people. Um, the two brothers you had up there, Ellie was blessed to go to seminary in Nigeria. David never went to seminary. But both are doing incredible work. Because nationals, folks, I believe our nationals are ready to teach. But we've got to give it away to them. Okay, I have another uh, controversial thing I'm going to say. Um, and it's to this group before me. And you can fire me, it's okay, because I'm done as convener on <laughs> day after tomorrow. We'll, we'll elect another one. So I don't want to okay. be the guy that got you fired. That's so, all right. I mean, I, you're my friend. But I, but I have another one. I have another one. I've been studying theological education in Africa for about 27 years, 26, 27 years, and, um, and have been in this role for a long time as well particularly related to theological education. And, I, and I've seen a trend, and I'm just putting this back on our institutions. I've seen a trend, and it's something that Stuart should say, but he won't say because he's too nice a guy to say it. So I'm going to say it for him. We, for years, and I could name countries, and, tell, and I'm talking about in our Baptist seminaries, we have seen this problem. We have a centralized institutional model. 
We know that there's no way the centralized institutional model is going to reach the entire country that we're trying to reach. So what we do is we have an idea we need to develop a branch system where we're going to have, you know, extension campuses of that seminary and we're going to spread those out. And then what we do is we say, well, that's not enough. Those are regional, better, but still not centralized. So we're going to develop a Bible school system that's more localized, maybe a little bit more. We would call it, I think we would say diversified. I've seen that model here in Kenya. I've seen that model in Zambia, in Malawi, in Tanzania, in Uganda, and I could go on and on and on. But here's what happens. 99% of the time, it's our Baptist seminaries who are creating those systems. But the question is this. Are they creating those systems in order to meet the needs of theological education around the continent? Or are they creating those systems in order to create feeders to maintain the institution? And I think we have to ask that question in this context. Who is our customer? Yes. And I think that many times our institutions were created, whether they were created by a partner or whether they were created by the denomination, our institutions were created to fill a need. But then what happens is that then we somehow, those needs, that vision gets lost and we actually spend all of our time, time trying to maintain the system, maintain the institution. We pour all of our money, all of our effort, all of our time, and we're trying to keep the institution, and we've lost the vision for why the institution was created. And the institution becomes an end in and of itself. Now, I'm not ag against institutions, of course. The Africa Baptist Theological Education Network exists to strengthen all the institutions that are in this, in this organization. But I think we have to ask these hard questions of ourselves, and especially of people like this who, because what I caught Stuart saying, this has nothing to do with his things. I'm, forgive me, I'm preaching. And besides, we were finished 15 minutes ago. You could have left. You didn't know it. But because he talked about something where he said that this has to be built from the ground up, not from the top down. And I think it comes to this second question. How can you partner with those outside your sector to create a more integrated strategy? So instead of us thinking, hey, you know what we have to do? We actually have to create extension campuses and branches and Bible school networks and all of those things in order to, keep, to, to feed our institution and keep it afloat and to create more students for us. Why not find, instead of reinventing the wheel, why not find partners who are already doing it well and collaborate with them so we're doing it hand in hand and they do what they do well and we love them and bless them and support them and help them through relationships, through providing contextualized theology and theological educators who are African that are able to do that so they're not constantly flying Americans to come and teach. And then also, too, where we're allowing them to run the race that God has given them and we, we work together and we partner together. And, and I can say we can do that as Baptists. Yes. I'm unashamedly Baptist and this is unashamedly the African Baptist Theological yes. Education Network. No, no, I'm not against other denominations. But we have plenty of Baptists who are doing diversified, uh, de decentralized theological education. We have plenty of Baptist institutions, and we need to collaborate. Where we play to our strengths, and we find others of like mind and like purpose who play to their strengths, and we cooperate together. I think that's my takeaway from, from his session. Um, because a lot of us, are, we already have Bible school networks. We, we, we're doing these things that World Hope is doing. But the question is, why and should we? I think that's my, my question. You probably had something to say, but we're going to dismiss. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm going to give my dear brother, um, Moses Audi the microphone. You have the last word. You have the last word. And then we have to go to our regional times. I'll give some instructions after this. Thank you for the privilege. Actually, one serious challenge we must face 
is that many times when we have these diversified small beginnings and we want to keep them at that level to meet the needs, they metamorphose to independent, structured institutions and you can do nothing about it. Uh, we have such experiences in Nigeria uh, where schools are created to take care of the uneducated, they can do orality and the rest of it, but each time those who go in there uh, want to keep climbing the ladder and those who are in the school and those who are in the community begin to clamor for uh, higher programs in those programs and those in those places and so it becomes very difficult to sustain them uh, it, it's, it's rather better to go back to a biblical model where the pastor realizes that his responsibility is to train for the field and theological institutions limit their resources and their capacity to training the trainers. Yeah. And if we are able to do that, we'll be able to maintain and ensure that the church is actually doing its work, missions, and is empowering people and sending them out. If they need some kind of empowerment, they collaborate with theological institutions that can hold seminars and workshops and training sessions uh, that we empower them to keep going. Uh, um, that, I think, is what I would uh, suggest. Thank you.